Epilogue. It took a decade after the two Johns met for their industry to come of age. Video game sales hit a record 10.8 billion in the United States, once again surpassing box office receipts. With the emerging multi-billion dollar market for games on cell phones, games would outsell music too. Gamers were also growing up. Far from being pimply boys, their average age was 28. Their diversity reflected the new range of game themes. From baseball to bridge, ancient Rome to future Japan, Mickey Mouse to David Bowie. An estimated 60% of all Americans, 145 million people, including 62 million women and the U.S. President, who admitted to daily rounds of computer solitaire, played. In countries such as Japan, Germany, and South Korea, games were already national pastimes. As games seized the mainstream, some of the tremors over first-person shooters began to subside. Senator Lieberman praised the game company's efforts in informing parents about mature content. And while there were continued efforts by politicians to legislate violent games, the court sent a message by throwing out the million-dollar lawsuit that alleged that teenage shooters at Columbine and Paducah were influenced by Doom. This was a tragic situation, a U.S. district judge declared. But tragedies such as this simply defy rational explanation, and the court should not pretend otherwise. The time also proved the end of the era, particularly for the extended family of Silicon Alamo. Dallas, once home to at least a half dozen game companies, saw some of its most ambitious startups, including Romero's Ion Storm and Mike Wilson's Gathering of Developers, close their doors. A golden age seemed to have passed when rebellious outsiders could independently rule a multi-billion dollar industry. But the spirit remained. Even the largest companies now emulated the innovations of id, such as online play, giving away demos, and encouraging game modification. But they called it viral marketing. And with new platforms like mobile games emerging, maybe the next great gamers were waiting to rise from the swamps. The world would always be ready for the next great games. As for id, the company's decision to revisit its former hits met with mixed results. The id-developed Mission Pack Quake 3 Team Arena was both a critical and a commercial disappointment, viewed by many as a lackluster attempt to answer the success of Unreal Tournament. A Game Boy Advance version of Commander Keen, produced but not developed by id, met a similar reception. Return to Castle Wolfenstein, however, proved to both, both be a critical and a commercial smash, even though the title bore little resemblance to its predecessor, aside from a few turkey dinners on the tables. This period saw John Carmack elevated to legendary status. His innovations in graphics programming were among the reasons why, as MIT's Technological Review magazine put it, video games drive the evolution of computing. And his philanthropy, including the source code he continued to give away for free online, was surpassed by none. At an annual Game Developers Conference in San Jose, a 29-year-old Carmack became the third and youngest person ever inducted into the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences Hall of Fame. The Oscars of the Gaming Business After a videotaped congratulations from Bill Gates, who joked, I just want you to know that I can write slicker and tighter code than John. Carmack took the stage and endured a standing ovation from peers, comparable to that received by the industry's first inductee, Nintendo's Shigeru Miyamoto. Creator of the very Mario game Carmack had replicated on the PC that fateful night at Softdisk. The question on many gamers' minds was whether Carmack would be done with games after Doom 3. Carmack himself wasn't sure. Between game and engine license sales, he felt he had more than enough money, and in fact, was frequently given to charities. Plus, after so many years immersed in science of graphics, 
he had achieved an almost zen-like understanding of his craft. In the shower, he would see a few bars of light on the wall and think, Hey, that's a diffuse specular reflection from the overhead lights reflected off the faucet. Rather than detaching him from the natural world, this viewpoint only made him appreciate it more deeply. These are things I find enchanting and miraculous, he said. I don't have to be at the Grand Canyon to appreciate the way the world works. I can see that in reflections of light in my bathroom. He immersed himself more deeply in a new source of learning, his rockets. On Saturdays, he met with his team of rocketeers, including Ferrari whiz Bob Norwood, to work on what he called his vertical landing hydrogen peroxide rocket vehicles. Carmack fashioned a lunar lander-style craft, complete with a bucket seat in the middle for him or his wife, Anna. Next up, maybe a shot at the $10 million X Prize, which required the winner to launch three people into orbit and back two times within 14 days. Those who knew Carmack expected him to have a decent shot. John Romero, meanwhile, was happy to set his sights closer to home. Living with Stevie Case in their sprawling house in the Dallas countryside, he decided to get back, as he said, to his roots, designing and programming games. After some brief attempts at a traditional publishing deal, Romero, Stevie, and Tom Hall, despite good reviews on Anachronox, decided to forego the route of ambitious computer games for the uncharted territory of games for pocket computers cell phones, and other handheld devices. As the first well-known developer to embrace this new era of gaming, Romero became a cheerleader for mobile games, much the way he was once for PC. True to the original vision of a small team turning out small games with short development cycles, Monkey Stone completed their first title, Hyperspace Delivery Boy, in a matter of months. Working with three other developers late into the night, at Romero's country house, Tom and Romero designed and programmed the entire game just like the old days. The game cast players as Guy Carrington, an interstellar courier whose job was to deliver the universe's most important parcels. One reviewer called Hyperspace Delivery Boy one of the few pocket PC games worth buying. Next up, maybe a new version of Commander Keen, thanks to a license purchased from id. Tom was happy to have his boy, Billy Blaze, back home. For Romero, the fun at Monkey Stone wasn't just a new beginning. It was a break from the past. Shortly after his 34th birthday, he followed Tom's lead and cut off the notorious hair he'd been growing since 1991, leaving him with a close-cropped coif that was as easy to manage as his new company. Never one to let things go to waste, Romero wrapped the long black mane in a package and donated it to Locks of Love, a non-profit group that supplies hair pieces for sick and needy children. His trademark hair wasn't the only thing to go. Now that he was living amid the trucks and dirt roads of the country, Romero found little use for his once prized possession, the Ferrari that Doom bought. He lovingly photographed the car from a variety of angles in his front yard and uploaded the pictures with a description to eBay the popular online auction depot, with the headline, Brutal Luxury. His opening price of 65000 was well worth it, he explained, considering the more than 100000 of modifications he installed, from the turbo system to the custom engine. The sound that comes out of this car is completely amazing and destructive, he wrote. Going down the street, you will sound like an indie car when you hit the gas. All you can do is laugh. It's so awesome. It was, he promised, the most awesome Ferrari Tessarossa you'll ever see. The buyer who drove it away for 82500 agreed. Another Ferrari would bring Romero and Carmack back together. It happened outside a Quake 3 tournament in Mesquite. In previous years, the two Johns all but ignored each other here. But this time was different. The games had been played. The scores had been settled. 
and a friend was in need. Carmack was in the parking lot having trouble starting his engine. Hearing a rumble, he looked up into the headlights of a fly yellow Hummer. Romero stepped from the car, jumper cables at the ready. There was work to be done. Author's Note Like a lot of people in their 30s, I grew up in the same nascent gamer culture as the two Johns. My favorite birthday present was a paper bag filled with tokens from Wizards, my neighborhood arcade. Wizards was the place. Dark and windowless like a casino, lined with all the latest games flashing and beeping along the walls. I dumped a sizable portion of my lawn mowing money in there. I owned the high score on Crazy Climber. And, after a challenging night with a bottle of Boone's Farm Apple wine, I triumphantly vomited on a game called Omega Race. I was only a kid, but I sure felt free. With video games came other explorations of fantasy, control, and rebellion. One time, my friends and I chucked a smoke bomb into a creek, only to see a six-foot tongue of flames lick the sky. I never ran so fast in my life. We played Dungeons and Dragons. We launched lizards high above the suburbs in tiny model rockets. My first attempt at hacking occurred at Chuck E. Cheese, the pizza parlor arcade chain launched by Atari's Nolan Bushnell. This was in the early 1980s, and the cheese had just gotten in a few primordial computers. For a token, we could type in any kind of message, and the computer would speak it back in its robotic voice. Of course, we immediately tried to type in profanities, but the machine was programmed not to accept them. So we typed, Fook, the manager, instead, taping down the keys so the message looped. I was in my 20s working at an online bulletin board service in New York City when I first heard about Doom. One night, late after work, a friend of mine booted it up and I jumped in for a round. Several hours later, we stumbled out into the darkness. This was a game. A couple years later, in 1996, I managed to convince an editor to assign me an article about the subculture of Quake, the latest from id Software. The next thing I knew, I was tripping over wires in a University of Kansas flophouse where the two top clans, Impulse 9 and the Ruthless Bastards, had convened for a marathon deathmatch. These people were sacrificing everything to inhabit, modify, and create alternate realities. This wasn't just a game. This was a world. A relatively and alluring, undocumented world. Filled with characters and stories and dreams and rivalries. The world led me to the two Johns. I spent the next six years exploring and chronicling the lives and industry of gamers. It was both amazing and frustrating to me that this multi-billion dollar business and culture remained such a mystery to so many people. And that mystery was breeding confusion and misperceptions everywhere I turned. To me, the story of John Carmack and John Romero was a classic American adventure that captured the birth of a new medium and the coming of age of two compelling and gifted young people. By telling it, I hoped to give gamers the respect and understanding they deserved. And I wanted the reader to have a good time. This concludes Masters of Doom, How Two Guys Created an Empire and Transformed Pop Culture by David Kushner.